Aloha. Now, imagine walking into a home that is filled with perfect strangers you've never met before, never seen. And you've been summoned to this home because someone has asked you to help with some evil spirits who's been there and causing problems in the home. As you walk in and you meet with the people, one of these perfect strangers turn their head towards you, look you straight in the eye, and call you by a name that only you and your family know. What would you do? How would you react in this situation? Now, this is a situation I found myself in in 1972 when I was 19 years old and attending BYU Provo uh, for my second year in college. Now, I had moved up to Utah to attend BYU and I found off-campus housing and living uh, with a group of Native Americans and I was introduced to the Native American culture. Uh, being a Hawaiian, brown skin, long hair, I fit in really well. Well, one weekend, one of my roommates received a frantic call, frantic call from a woman who was panicking. In fact, I was close to my roommate when he received the call and I could hear the woman crying and asking for help, pleading for help. So I was there and there were two other of our roommates that were not on dates on the weekend. So they, these, uh, we called the roommates into the living room and we had a meeting and he explained what was going on. And apparently these women were living in a home and one of them was addicted to playing the Ouija board. Yeah. And with the Ouija board being active in that home, it started to attract spirits into the home. And some of these spirits were causing problems. So after hearing the situation, and for me, I had read about some of the things that can happen to people who become addicted to the Ouija board and how it can uh, basically run the life and ruin the life of people who keep on using it. So I, I was curious about that to see how this worked in real life, okay? So after our roommates got together, we prayed for protection and guidance from God because we cannot do these things by ourselves. Um, we need to cooperate and work together to try and solve this problem. And this is something I learned from my dad. So we headed over to the home and when we arrived at the home, we started looking at uh, the outside of the home and the home was, the home was a huge home, uh, but it was old and run down. And we found out that there were um, 12 people living in there. There were six bedrooms and only four bathrooms and a small kitchen. And it was filled with women. <laughs> That's a recipe for disaster. Okay, so there's a lot of potential for a lot of friction occurring in that house. Anyway, when we got to the front door, we knocked on the door and we were invited in. And as I was the last person stepping into the home, and as I started walking into the home, I felt something unusual pressing against my body like I was being pushed and, so and shoved and squeezed at the same time like something didn't want me there. It was trying to squeeze me out. And so me and my roommates, I fought through that, and me and my roommates approached the women, a group of women that were sitting, uh, sitting on a floor in a living room, and there were eight of them. And each of them were pretty nervous. Some of them were crying. Some of them looked really worried, had a worried look on their face, and not too sure what was going on. So. My roommate began to introduce uh, introduce us, and he started off with my other two roommates. And before he could introduce me to the group, a woman who's sitting right in front of me, uh, with her back face towards me, turns her head around, and the way it turned was almost uh, like her head was on a swivel almost like a scene straight out of the poltergeist, okay? 
And she looked at me and she smiled and she says, Hello, David John. In that kind of voice. And I looked at her and I said, I started thinking to myself, how does this stranger know my name? And this name, David John, is something that only my parents, my brothers and sisters, and really close family members, and some people on Molokai, they're the only people that know me by that name. Up at BYU, I was just Dave, the Hawaiian. <laughs> okay, so it threw me off. I said, whoa, how does this lady know my name? So I began to think about it, and um, with this, it was uh, like a light of caution for me. Beware, something's there. I need to be, uh, I need to focus my attention on this, especially this lady. Something's happening with this particular lady. Okay, so I excused myself from the group, and I walked back, and I wanted to get a general perspective of what was happening inside the home. So I walked away from the group and I closed my eyes and I asked God to show me what was happening inside the home. Reveal. Please reveal to me what's happening in this home. So I closed my eyes and using my spiritual eyes, as was taught to me in my first near-death experience, and I started looking around and panning around. And as my eyes began to focus on the movement that was occurring there, I was completely shocked by what I saw. There are hundreds of spirits, not just one or two running around. There are hundreds of them roaming in and out of the place. Some of them looking pretty gray, you know, very grumpy some of them were not happy at all some of them were irritated as if they were ready to chop my head off and some of them was kind of like eh, I, don't know, I don't care you know so these spirits were walking around and there were a mixture of spirits most of the spirits there were dressed in native american garb um customers or clothing uh, some of these Native Americans were wearing simple loincloths and very, very minimal dress. It's almost like a Hawaiian wearing only a malo. Okay? And for um, some of these other spirits, you could tell that they occupied a higher rank in their society because they had beadwork, very fine work, uh, leather jackets and shoes and some of them also had war bonnets. So these were important people to the people that were living there, could be their ancestors. There was also another group of um, white spirits, okay? Um, you could tell that they were probably spirits of settlers who had come into Provo area um, during the Mormon migration by the way they were dressed. And some of them were um, irritated and you could tell that whatever was happening in the home was attract not only attracting spirits but it was irritating the spirits for what they were doing so <clears throat> I came back to the group and I started looking at the women sitting there and as I started looking at the women I could identify um, three of the women had spirits that were like parasites, almost like opihi or barnacles that had attached themselves um, to the women on the back and in front. So some of them had two spirits, some of them had only one on the back, and there were three like that. And the one woman that knew my name as I focused on her, wow, <laughs> she was in a haze, like she was just encased with um, these demons that decided to try and work on her. I later found out that's the woman that was addicted to the Ouija board. Okay, and so as I looked at her, there's not only um, spirits that were around her, but as I looked into her, uh, tried to see inside her, 
I also saw multiple spirits that had occupied her body and affecting her behavior and affecting her <coughs> personally. <coughs> Excuse me. So after um, I, I saw what I saw, <coughs> excuse me, I decided to talk to my roommates on the side. I pulled them off on the side. <coughs> and told them what I had seen and who the women were affected. And the roommate that was in charge of, um, of this process that we were going through um, decided that, you know what, since we have all the people there, sitting there, that were affected by these things, um, maybe it would be best that we uh, bless and cleanse all of them. So I told my roommate, I said, you see that woman that called me by David John? I said, yeah, let's save her for last. And so we agreed. And so my roommates, uh, who were returned missionaries and they were ordained elders, um, began the process of doing the cleansing using the oil, the holy oil, and the blessings that Mormons do to help heal people. Okay, um, because I was not ordained, I was given the job of watching the spirits where they go and uh, giving them guidance as far as where you can, uh, where the spirit should go. So I walked to the front door and opened up the front door and I stood next to the front door, making sure that the spirits would leave. So as I started blessing the people, the ones that had no uh, spirits attack, uh, spirit attachments, nothing came out of them, so that was no problem. But as the ones that had the spirit attachments were being blessed um, and cleansed, the spirits would get up off of the, uh, I could see them stand up and walk towards the door and I would kind of like gesture them with my hand just like this way. <laughs> and they followed directions really well and walked out of the home. And finally, when it came to the last woman, uh, as soon as, as soon as her head was anointed with the holy oil, she started screaming. Screaming, 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 and fighting, fighting, and the person that uh, had anointed her with the oil, she turned around and cranked them and kicked them. And we realized that, wow, in order to get this woman taken care of, we had to hold her down. Now, this woman was a, a tiny, tiny woman. Lucky if she was, um, you know, over four, uh, any, anything over four, eight. I, I guess, and if she made a hundred pounds, that would be uh, after a big meal. <laughs> so she was a tiny thing, and so it took four of us to hold her down, and till finally uh, the anointing and the sealing and the blessing could be done. And I had her feet, and while she was struggling. Um, during the anointing, uh, she lifted up her head and looked straight at me, and she started pleading, David John, please, please, don't let these people destroy me, please, and pleading to me, like, let me go, you know, please, I'm not, I'm not causing any problems, please, pleading, and that's a sign, okay, so, um, as the spirits, as the uh, <laughs> as the process began to work, and the spirits knew that we were there to remove them, and finally they started to cooperate. The spirits began to leave her one by one, and as the spirits began to leave her, she adopted a very strange way of breathing, and she would breathe in. And when she breathed out, she would let out a low rumbling sound, something like this. <laughs> and with every breath that she exhaled, a spirit would rise up and walk out. 
and I started counting. There were six of them. When the final spirit came out, and the spirit emerged, it was a huge one. It was ugly. It was mad and angry. Not at anybody else, but turned to me with full wrath in his face, and I could see this anger. And I realized that if this spirit stayed in the home, it would cause even more problems. So I accompanied it until it walked to the front door. And as it, before it stepped out of the home, it turned to me and looked me in the eye and said, David John, I hate you. And he turned in disgust and walked away. That was the last spirit to leave the home. When that last spirit left the home, you could feel a, a sense of relief overcome everybody in the home. You could feel the home lighten up. Instead of being uh, constricted and instead of being prevented from moving anything, the air moved freely. And so um, I went back to the, uh, to the people, you know, sitting there. And the four women who had um, these evil spirits removed fell into a deep sleep. And this is really common because it's really exhausting to have to play host to these parasites who's draining you dry. So you're completely um, wiped out and you go into a, uh, a deep sleep and recovery mode. And this deep sleep can last anywhere from 10 minutes to 15 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes you sleep the whole night. And But when you finally wake up, um, we were there for, we decided to stay there until the women, all of the women wake up so we make sure that they're okay. And so we stayed there for a good 15, 20 minutes. And finally when the last woman with all of the demons that was on her woke up, I walked up to her and I says, how are you feeling? And she looked at me, oh, I'm feeling good. And she looks at me kind of like confused. Who are you? <laughs> now this is a woman that called me by a name that only my family members knew just a few, you know, about an hour or so before that. And she looks at me, who are you? <laughs> totally unaware. So um, that was our my first experience with uh, exercising demons from uh, people and uh, this is the first time I did it, did it with such a large group of people um, normally in my experience after that it was more one-on-one -on -one. the sad thing about that is that um, after this experience uh, even though this woman had experienced this um, bad bad you know possession uh, she kept on playing with the Ouija board and we were called over <laughs> several times uh, during this semester to help rid of the spirits. And uh, it's just that in the next times that we went back, the spirits knew better than to play, play games with me. And so they were pretty cooperative. Um, it was almost like paying tag with them. Okay, so... This is my experience, uh, my first experience dealing with exercising spirits, and in, um, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you enjoy the stories that I'm sharing, please share it with other people and subscribe, so that you can uh, you can be the first ones to see my videos as they come out. And this is Dave Wallace coming to you from Waihoa, and see you next time. Aloha.